If you've been struggling through dealing with or recovering from an unhealthy relationship with a narcissist or other toxic personality, The Little Shaman has a catalog of over 500 YouTube videos designed to support your journey from discovery to recovery. You can also find additional resources on the Little Shaman website, including tools, courses, workshops, a support group with weekly meetings, and one-on-one appointments with the Little Shaman that are open to clients worldwide. There's even an AI chatbot built and trained exclusively by the Little Shaman using her work that can answer questions 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For more information, visit littleshaman.org. You can listen to The Little Shaman wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Hey, everybody. It's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something important to understand about narcissists, and that is the big con perpetrated by these personalities in relationships. Pathologically narcissistic personalities are known for being quite manipulative, both intentionally and just as a matter of function. There are many forms this manipulation can take, from the insidious to the outright comical, but the bigger and more intrinsic of these manipulations is one that is often much more serious and much harder to see, perhaps exactly because it's so big and so much of a part of things that it can't really be seen, like not being able to see the earth because you're standing on it. More than any singular manipulation or lie that a narcissistic personality may perpetrate, the big con is more damaging because it creates an impression, what seems to be a reality, that is essentially the exact opposite of what you're actually dealing with. The big con, perhaps the biggest and most damaging con regarding narcissists, is the impression that you're dealing with a whole adult person in the first place. You're not. This is the most damaging illusion regarding dealing with these personalities because there are so many automatic assumptions made by your brain that turn out to be terribly, painfully false. When you believe that you're dealing with a whole adult person, you assume that they are indeed an adult with an adult's ability to reason, communicate, regulate their emotions, manage themselves in their lives, solve their own problems, bond with other people, love other people, see other people at all. So many basic fundamental things that are just not true and that your brain cannot really conceive of not being true because it thinks it's engaging with another whole adult human being when it's not. So it keeps trying within that framework to do exactly that, engage with this person as a whole, fully functioning adult on an adult level. And it fails because that's just not where they are. But they can often hide that for short periods of time through mimicry. It's how they've survived. Their act isn't actually all that great a lot of the time, but it's like, how good of camouflage do you really need to hide things from somebody who's not even looking for them? Who doesn't even know that these things exist? Why would anybody ever look at another adult human being walking around the world and just assume that that's not what they actually are. You wouldn't, of course, and nobody ever does. That's what makes this so dangerous, and the way our brains function compounds the danger even more because even when we actually know that's not true, our brains continue to react as if it is. This usually results in massive confusion for people and, sadly, in repeated opportunities for narcissists to use, abuse, or otherwise cause harm to the same person or the same people over and over again. It's important to understand that this doesn't happen because something is wrong with you. It happens because your brain is actually doing what it's supposed to do. It's not misidentifying narcissists because something's wrong with your brain. It's misidentifying narcissists because what they appear to be is not what they really are. Your brain cannot interact with something as if it's something else, no matter how much you tell yourself that this is the truth. It will go by what it sees and the framework that it has in place for that particular thing. This is part of why, for example, both people and animals can be frightened by something that just looks like something they're already afraid of, like a snake. It's also part of the reason why the uncanny valley effect or the uncanny valley hypothesis happened. The uncanny valley effect happens when people have reactions of revulsion and fear to robots and androids that appear too much like humans but still are clearly not. Most of us like robots that are clearly robots doing some human things. Most of us don't like robots that look too much like people but don't behave like people. The theory is that these robots trigger recognition in the brain that they actually are a person, but they don't behave or move like one and things like that. They don't feel like a human being to us, in other words. So this confuses our brain and results in these negative reactions. We see this reaction in people to dolls sometimes. For example, um, if their eyes are too lifelike, too much like a person's eyes. Interestingly, as the human resemblance increases, this can change. 
the more truly human-like the robot or android seems, the more the affected person's negative feelings might change. It may be that the more human-like the robot appears, the more we judge it by human standards, and if it cannot convincingly move or behave like a human, it triggers the same negative feelings that a real person would trigger if they were behaving like a robot, or in some way that doesn't apply to the brain's existing framework for how human beings are supposed to behave. The brain, then, is perhaps no longer identifying the robot as a robot, but as a person, who does not seem or feel normal to the brain and is therefore considered creepy or scary. This results in a dip, a valley of negative reactions between two positive spheres of reaction for which the effect is named. We sometimes see this reaction to psychopaths and narcissists. There are some people who meet psychopaths or narcissists and instantly dislike them but don't know why. They often describe them as scary or creepy, even when there's nothing they can actually point to that would be causing that reaction. We often hear them say things about the narcissist or the psychopath's eyes, similar to what we hear from people who don't like when a doll's eyes are too lifelike. Ironically, what we often hear from people about psychopathic human beings is that their eyes are dead. This makes sense. People who are sensitive to this would not like a lifeless thing with eyes that seem alive, and they also wouldn't like a living thing with eyes that seem dead. So why doesn't this reaction keep people away from narcissists and psychopaths? Well, first of all, everybody doesn't experience it, but even if someone does, narcissists are not robots. They actually are people. And remember that the more human-like the robot appears, the more positive feelings like empathy that there are. Much like what we discussed about the ELISA effect that occurs with AI chatbots, the brain will automatically assume that this goes both ways. If it isn't even possible for the brain to prevent this from happening with a machine, and studies have consistently demonstrated that it isn't, it would be completely impossible with an actual human being, especially if you interact with that human being consistently. People who have an uncanny valley reaction to human beings generally only have it at first. This has saved people's lives, by the way. Several women reported having this reaction to Ted Bundy when he approached them, for example. But if you continue to interact with this person, this reaction changes because you actually are dealing with a real human being, so your brain goes ahead and utilizes all the same assumptions and all the same framework that it uses for other adult human beings. People who treat and work with dangerous psychopaths report this happening all the time. Some have been hurt or badly frightened because of it. Others have been manipulated to act on the psychopath's behalf somehow or to otherwise do things for them. And these are intelligent people who know exactly what they're dealing with. Later, they often say things like, well, I got too comfortable or I forgot what this person really was. And that's understandable, but it's not totally accurate. They didn't forget anything. Not really. Their brain was functioning as it's supposed to. That's all. The brain sees a fellow human being and it will automatically operate based on the framework it has for that, regardless of what it actually knows. Doesn't matter. This is the same for narcissists, by the way, and it's the reason why we don't need to wonder if they will ever treat some other person differently or better. The answer is no. They see everybody the same, just like every other human being on the planet does. They don't see everyone the same way that you do, no, but that doesn't mean they don't see them all the same as each other. They do, and you can actually see that when you look at relationships over the course of their lives. The way we humans treat other humans is not about the other humans. It's about us, and narcissists are no different in this regard. People sometimes disagree with that, but the proof of it is in your own behavior. You didn't repeatedly show an abuser empathy, compassion, kindness, and love because they somehow earned that or they deserved it or for any other reason at all other than because that's who you are. It's the same for everybody else, including narcissists. They claim that their behavior is controlled and caused by other people, but so what? They claim all kinds of stuff is not true. This is just one more of those things. When we look at their behavior, we can see that they have choices, and because of that, we can objectively conclude that they're not being controlled by anybody. They chose that behavior, and they can keep the responsibility for it, whether they agree with that or not. Don't let this responsibility be passed to you. They chose the behavior. They had a choice, and that's what they picked. This is unfortunately another issue caused by the big con in these relationships. We generally assume that the things other adults say are grounded in reality and are therefore worthy of serious consideration. So we take them seriously. We consider them. We assume other adults won't make things up or lie like a child would just to get out of trouble or just to cause problems. We assume adults have adult motives for their behaviors and the things that they're saying. More even than assuming that they're empathic or caring, we assume that adults are adults. We assume we can communicate with them and that they want to communicate with us for the same reasons. Sadly, as we have all found, assuming this about narcissistic personalities is a very large and costly mistake because it's simply not true. 
Narcissists don't want what you want. They don't see what you see. They don't think what you think. They don't do what you do. They just don't. And understanding this may be the single most important factor to understanding how this works. They don't want equal partnerships or family relationships. Why would that even cross their minds if they believe they are legitimately the only thing that matters in life? It doesn't, because they do in fact believe that. Consider the rage, the hurt, the confusion when they are forced to face the reality that this isn't actually true. That tells you everything you need to know. We all faced the same trauma years and years ago when we were very, very small. We all had to come to the realization that the world does not revolve around us. And though it traumatized us and it wounded us all as it does to every human being, we adapted. We learned our place in the world. We came to a more realistic understanding and acceptance of our own importance in that context. This does not seem to have happened for pathologically narcissistic personalities, or it didn't happen correctly, and they face that same terrible traumatic realization every single time they are forced to face the reality that they really are not the only people who matter. This, more than anything, speaks to how arrested these personalities really are. This is something that happened for most of the rest of us before we were even old enough to remember, and they're still dealing with it every hour of every day. This is not a person who can understand that other people matter. This is not a person who understands that they don't understand that. This is not even a person who can be told that they don't understand that. They have no framework through which to understand what they're being told. Of course they understand other people exist. Don't they see you standing in front of them? Of course other people matter. Didn't they give you a bite of their sandwich? That's as far as you're going to get with it. You might as well be speaking another language. You basically are, and that's a danger of the big con. They will reply to you in the language everybody else uses, using the same words everybody else uses, and create the illusion that communication is happening when it's not. It can take decades for people to truly understand this, and it's often very damaging because people are repeatedly told that the problem is them, when in reality, communication with this person is just not possible for anyone. The illusion that it is, is just part of the con. This is why no contact is seen as the only real solution to this situation. There's no real way to protect yourself from this if you are going to interact with narcissists. You can do things that minimize the damage, such as keep interactions short, keep them simple, and only interact when absolutely necessary, but that's really about it because you can't protect yourself from being conned in this way regardless of what you think. It's built into the interaction. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype for clients worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, clinics, and seminars. So if you're interested in seeing what we are offering this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you are interested in joining our support group, with weekly support meetings, access to exclusive content, and more. You can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day.